with me this morning to the book of St. Mark, chapter 15. Kathy, give me that American standard. The book of St. Mark, chapter 15. I got this sermon. I preached very few sermons or other people's sermons, but the Lord spoke to me about this. I was with Paris and Frank at a Kenneth Hagin convention a few years ago and got to hear one of the greatest men of God, in my opinion, named Reinhard Bunke. And I just enjoy him, and one day maybe I'll get to preach with him. It'd be a blessing. If I don't preach with him here, I'll preach with him in heaven. And it's going to be a blessing. St. Mark chapter 15, I want to start reading with verse 42. I want to talk this morning. You've heard this. You need to hear it again. God just changed it. He said, I want you to, he said, hold what you're going to do to, this morning, tonight. And I said, okay. A lot of people said, Brother Jesse, you're very exuberant. You're a man that has a lot of personality. No, I don't. I don't have a lot of personality. I have a lot of Holy Ghost. I've learned to be pressed down, shaking together, running over. Give me a sinner and I can change him. I'm talking about the ability of God inside of me. I'm not talking about Jesse. I've learned to attract sinners. The other day I was flying to Dallas to go preaching. Glory to God, Kathy was sleeping as usual on the plane. And a stewardess walked by and said, hello, Brother Jesse. And I said, how you doing? And she said, fine. She says, I need prayer. I said, bow down. She said, here. I said, bow down. She bowed down in the, in the little, uh, what do you call it? I, I'll praise God while Kathy was still sleeping. And we just prayed. And there was a man, I looked as I was about ready to pray. There was a man, he went, <laughs> just bowed his head and we prayed for her. It was a blessing of God. Is she here this morning? I think she's a Delta stewardess, glory to God, and she said she might be able to make one of the meetings if they're flying in. Just pray for her right there. People say, well, you're embarrassed. No! I closed my eyes. Nobody saw me. <laughs> I just enjoyed myself. I love to pray. I'm a man that enjoys praying. It's a blessing of God to pray. How many people pray? How many people enjoy praying those early morning hours? When your clock rings at 5.30, do you say, God, I wish I'd kill Larry Lee starting this junk? <laughs> or do you say, boy, I thank God that God gave Larry Lee a vision to pray an hour a day. Think about that for a minute. It's called crucifix crucifixion of the flesh. Mark 15, I heard this man say this thought, and it blessed me. About, what, two or three years ago we was at that convention. Jesus is dead and buried. From the position of the flesh, everybody thinks he's lost. That's it. It's gone. Christianity has died. Now, what's amazing to me, Prescott, the only person that believed that Jesus would rise from the dead was the high priest Caiaphas. Everybody else done quit. Caiaphas said, get me some guards. Now, if Caiaphas would have really known Peter, James, and John, <laughs> he'd have said, my God, that's the safest tomb in Jerusalem. Because the Bible said they all forsook him. But that man had an unction to function. He said, something's up. I sense it. So let's put guards at this man's tomb. Mark 15, verse 42, the Bible reads, And when evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, verse 43, I'm reading out of the American Standard translation, Joseph of Arimathea came. A prominent member of the council. I wonder what council he was from. A man who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. Are you a man waiting for the kingdom of God? Are you a woman seeking the kingdom of God? And he gathered up courage. Notice this. He gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. This man was a Jew conquered by the Roman society and he had to have enough guts and gall to go in there and ask the governor of that providence for Jesus' body. Verse 44, and Pilate wondered if he was dead by that time. Now, that's an amazing statement. Why would Pilate wonder about that? Because if anybody understood crucifixion, the Romans did. And crucifixion is a terrible, terrible, terrible death. You die by asphyxiation. You smother to death. What happens is you're, all your joints of your bone comes out of socket and the weight of your body begins to slowly like a vice crush your chest till you can't breathe. That's the reason they broke the legs of criminals so they couldn't push themselves up on the cross. As long as they could push themselves up, they could breathe. But as you hang there and hang there, it's a terrible death. And Pilate said, surely he isn't dead yet. My God, it takes at least two or three days. 
but he didn't realize the suffering that Jesus had gone through. Verse 44, And Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Notice this. He said, my God, he can't be dead. Let me get one of my boys to go down there and check him out. I'm not going to believe one of these Jews, one of these uh, whatever you call these people. I'm going to get somebody that's loyal to me to find out if the man's dead. Verse 46, And Joseph brought a linen sheet, took him down, wrapped him in the linen sheet, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb, and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph were looking on to see where he was laid. Title of my sermon this morning, Is Your Jesus Dead? Is your Jesus dead? Do you believe in Jesus just on Sunday morning? You can forget Sunday night and forget them cell groups because I ain't getting out. When it rains, do you still go to church? What would happen, bless God, if it was raining and the rapture come? Would you ask God, shut the shower off and then I'll go? Don't you think about that for a minute. Why are people looking for excuses to miss church? Why don't you look for an excuse to go? Why don't you look for an excuse to get into the presence of God? Is your Jesus dead? Now, notice something about Pilate here. Pilate said, my God, he can't be dead now. He said, I refuse to believe that that man's dead. So he would not accept anybody's information or anyone else other than his own centurion. Why didn't Pilate release that body? I'll tell you why, see. He said, centurion, go out there, and when you come back, you let me know if that man's dead. And the centurion went and looked at Jesus' body and came back and said, Oh, Governor Pilate, Jesus the Christ is dead. Why wouldn't Pilate release that body? Because he knew if he released that body that a live Jesus could help hurt him, but a dead Jesus couldn't. Is your Jesus dead today? I want you to think about it. Notice this, what he's saying here. And when he knew of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. He said, I refuse to, I, to take anybody's word unless I know that man's dead. Why? Because a dead Jesus can't heal the sick. A dead Jesus can't raise the dead. A dead Jesus can't cast out devils. A dead Jesus can't preach a dead religion. But a live Jesus can heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely receive and freely give. A live Jesus can take New Orleans, Louisiana, but a dead Jesus can't do nothing. Is your Jesus dead today. How don't you think about that? Does the devil have to say, oh, we don't have to worry about them. They're religiously brainwashed. A lot of people say, you don't even embarrass the witness for God. No, you know why? Because my Jesus isn't dead. When I told that student to kneel down in that aisle, bless God, I didn't care if everybody on that plane heard me. It didn't make me no difference because one day they're going to hear me shout, glory to God. I'm going home to be with God forever and ever. They're going to watch me fly without a plane. Glory to God. I'm going to fly. Hallelujah. Because Jesus, my Jesus is alive. Is your Jesus is alive. I want you to think about that for a minute. I've seen so many beat, busted, poorly shod Christian people that it makes me sick. And I'm not talking about how much money you got, what kind of car you're driving, what kind of clothes you're wearing. I'm talking about this sick, sad attitude that, you, that God doesn't heal every time. You people watching my television, listen to me. I want to tell you something. God heals every time if you'll receive it every time. You've got to receive. You can't get saved until you receive it. You can't get healed until you receive it. You can't get blessed until you receive it. You understand what I'm saying? Quit blaming things on God with your theological views, with your religion of garden of weeds. We've learned to fertilize the weeds of religion. And the great and beautiful plants have died because most people, their Jesus is dead. Pilate said, I refuse to release that body unless I know he's dead. If he's dead, you can have him. But if he's not, he's got to stay there till he's dead. A dead Jesus can't hurt me, Joseph of Arimathea, but a live Jesus can take the throne of Rome. I want you to listen to this. We as believers of the Lord should produce life-changing realities to a spiritually dead generation. When I get around people, I want to change them from sin into life. This is my point. We as believers of the Lord should produce life-changing realities to a spiritually dead generation. I don't get all bent out of shape when I get cussed out for witnessing. I get, that happens to me a lot. You're some choice words. Some heavy stuff. I've had Christians get mad at me because they said, he, oh, all you want to talk about is God. Well, bless God. Do you know how big he is? 
You have to understand that. I'm going to produce a life-changing reality to a dead generation. When I witness for people, I don't walk up to them and say, would you like to meet Jesus Christ who rules and reigns in my life? <laughs> They'll tell you, no. <laughs> but if you let the spirit of life come out of your innermost being, when you realize that inside of you is God, God loves us so much. Don't you understand that? If people would just realize how much God loves us. God loves us so much that on resurrection day, he calls the ruckus. Jesus wasn't dead no more. Jesus said, you kill me, I'll raise this body in three days. The only one believed it was Caiaphas. He said, watch that tomb. Everybody else said, I'm going to fish it. Peter said four words and got seven converts. He said, I go a fishing. Everybody said, we're going with you, Jack. We quit too. <laughs> Anybody can quit. I had an evangelist tell me they're damn having financial trouble. How about ready to quit? I said, quit. Get out of here. He angered me. What did he anger you for? Because he told me that his God has failed him. The God that I serve cannot fail. Cannot. I refuse to accept failure of any nature, of any kind. Because my Jesus is alive. And well, that's easy for you to say. You never had tragedy before. I've had a bunch of it. But bless God, greater is he who's in me than he that's in the world. Lord. And I know in whom I have believed. I refuse to accept failure. Anybody can lay down like a dog and get kicked. I see so many dead Christians because the Jesus is dead. But if Jesus is alive, you are going to make dead people scream. You'll make dead religious theological fools holler because your Jesus is alive. They don't know how to handle life. When life gets around them, it's abundant. They call it over-excessive. Don't get over-excessive with this thing. Bless God, I want to be seduced. I want to be known as a person swallowed up in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you hear what I'm saying? We as believers of the Lord should produce life-changing realities to a spiritually dead generation. Let me tell you how much God loves people. Jesus rose from the dead people. Did you know that? The Bible said the angel came and rolled the stone away. Notice the angel didn't roll the stone away to let Jesus out. He rolled the stone away to let you in. Before the stone was rolled away, Jesus was already out the tomb. There was an earthquake. Whoa, wham! Jesus blew out of the rock. Then the angel came rolling the stone away because he knew that that day would be a busy day. <laughs> and the Bible said he sat up on it. You heard me preach that, sitting on God, sitting on your problems. And there's the guards from Caiaphas. They didn't mind the earthquake, but when that shining person sat down and said, Hello, boys, they said, Let's get out of here. You notice he rolled the stone away to let the people in. He didn't roll the stone away to let Jesus out. Jesus was already out of the tomb. Now notice this. Jesus resurrected. What kind of clothes was he wearing? He left these clothes in the tomb so he wasn't walking around without any clothes on. He was resurrected. The same the clothes he was wearing was that glistening robe of righteousness light that they saw on the Mount Transfiguration. He left his clothes as evidence physically, but he put on the robes of righteousness that could glow and kind of had like a knob on it. You could glow it up or glow it down. <laughs> Think about that. Now, you don't have to understand something. If you've read the scriptures, you'll find out that it's got angels all over the place. Some come, notice this, women are the first one to come to see if he, he's all right. And they walked in, they saw two, some of them saw two angels sitting. Some of them saw an angel outside said, he's not here, he is risen. Come see where he was laid. All the, I mean, angels commuting from heaven to the earth, all different kinds, not just one, not the same angel. No, all different kinds. Jesus already resurrected, but ready to make a trip to the holies of holies to pour out his blood for man's sin. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That wasn't just one angel. Some people saw one, some saw two. All kind of angels. I mean, everybody's freaking out. Heaven's busy. And that road to that tomb is busy. People are coming. Women of all kinds. Jesus had women partners. 
Jesus had financial partners to his ministry. He had a rich woman named Johanna who was Herod's steward, his wife. He had another one named Susanna. He had Mary and Martha, and he had lads that supported him. Some people washed his linen robe. Some bought him dinners. They gave to his ministry, and he fed the flocks. You have to understand that. Jesus had a lot of partners to his ministry. But a lot of angels were rolling that day, but all different kinds flying all over the place. One set of women would come, bless God, they'd see two of them. Another set would come, they'd see one. Some would be inside the tomb, some would be outside. I mean, it's a busy day, but there was one woman coming who would change the world, who would shut down redemption, who shut down the trip of Jesus. He made sin wait, he made heaven wait, he made hell wait, and he made righteousness wait. And her name was Mary Magdalene. The word Magdalene means watchtower. She was a prostitute at the watchtower. That simply means all the fishing boys that would come back off these long fishing trips. She'd take care of their needs as they came on shore. She was called Mary Magdalene. The word Magdalene means the watchtower where she was birthed. Jesus cast seven devils out that woman. He loved that woman, brother, because Jesus was alive. She was coming to take the Lord's body. How could she carry it? She said, where have you taken my Lord? She had made up her mind, if I got to drag his body down the road, I refuse to let anybody touch him. Jesus had 110 pounds of clothes on him, embalmed with all, every finger, all kinds of things. How did Jesus resurrect? He came out of the face. Now notice this. She sees an angel of God, Mary Magdalene, but she's so depressed you can get so depressed that you don't see the glory. You hearing me? She walked in the tomb. Here's the angel. Whoop, looked like a 100-watt light bulb just glowing all over. Everybody else is freaking out. All, they made, all different kinds of angels telling people, go tell the people he's risen. And people were afraid. Boy, no, I ain't saying nothing. But this woman, this lady, she said, if I got to drag his body, I'll do it. He may be dead to you, but he's not dead to me. And Jesus noticed her depression, and he shut heaven down. He said, wait, and he shut hell down, and he made Abraham and the captives, hang on, boys, don't move. And he shut history down in heaven, stop. He noticed she did not recognize the glory. She was so depressed. He said, my God, an angel can't help her. So I'm going to shut redemption down. I'm going to help her. He made Jesse the planters wait. He shut heaven down for Mary Magdalene. He shut redemption down. He was on the way to heaven. He saw that the angel couldn't get her out of depression. He said, my God, she needs a personal counseling session. She didn't see the glory. Now, the angels light up the empty tomb. People, do you understand what's happening here? Jesus noticed her. He notices that the angels sent by God can't get her out of depression. He says, I can get her out. So he turns off the glow of his robe of light, and he's walking in the garden. She said, Gardener! Have you taken my Lord Jesus? Where have you laid his body? He said, woman, why do you weep? What are you crying for? He had been preaching for three years to the woman that he'd raised from the dead. But notice this. He made redemption wait. He stopped the blood, brother. He stopped hell. He shut it down. Broke it. Stop. Don't move. I'm going to minister to this lady myself. Jesse's sins are just going to have to wait. Redemption's going to wait. That's how much he loves people. He said, if the angel of God can't pull you out of depression, I'll come myself. And he shut redemption down. He looked at it and said, Mary. She went, wow, Jesus. He said, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I have not yet ascended. She, she'd have grabbed me. He had to do the whole thing over again. Why? Because he'd have been defiled. He hadn't gone to heaven yet. 
He shut redemption down. He shut Abraham's bosom down. He shut hell down. He shut everything down to get to one little woman. Don't you realize what God did for that lady? Jesus said, all things must stop till Mary smiles. That's pretty nice Jesus. Now notice she hasn't seen the glory on the angel. The angel's trying to help her out, but he ain't good enough. So God says, I'll come myself. And he said, Mary, go tell Peter and John I'm alive. She said, yeah, Uncle, that I can do. And she hooked it down that road. <laughs> While she's running down the road, Jesus says, okay, start up again. Vroom, throws on the glow of light. Wham, goes to heaven. Goes into the holies of holies. He said, I've come to make a sacrifice for Jesse the Planets' sin. I've come to make a sacrifice for Caiaphas' sin. I've come to make a sacrifice for Pilate's sin. He blows his blood on the holies of holies in heaven. Notice this. He looks at his heavenly father and says, man's become the righteousness of God. I have defeated all enemies for your creation, man, my heavenly father. He said, but I don't have to talk. I don't have time to talk. I got to get back down there. I'll see you after a while. Wham! Goes back down to the earth. Here come another bunch of women. Boy, they're coming, boy. Come and look at the tomb. He meets them on the road and he says, Hail! They went, Wow! Jesus! Then they grabbed him and hugged him and they put their hands on their feet. What had happened? Jesus shut down redemption, brother. He shut down hell. He shut down heaven. He shut down every angel to get one little woman out of depression. So he ought to take care of your light bill, don't you think? <laughs> he'll shut heaven down to get to you. And if an angel can't get you to smile, he'll come himself. Is your Jesus dead? No, he's alive and doing well. See, serving a dead Jesus will produce a lethal inconsistency. A dead, empty life and a dead faith. I've seen a lot of people there in church this morning. They're dead as a donail spiritually. Their lives are lethal. Lethal and inconsistency. Empty lives. Talk about how much they love God and can't get along with their wife. The world's being run by the spirit of eros, the spirit of lust, the spirit of sex. You can't buy a tube of toothpaste unless a woman's got in a bikini on it. It's run by the spirit of lust. You hear what I'm saying? The 60s generation is the most hypocritical generation ever birthed on the planet Earth. Because they came up with do your own thing, free love. Woodstock, yeah, get down. Smoke, nope, snort it. Just be you. Most hypocritical generation ever birthed on the planet Earth. Look what they produced. Five million babies a day dying. AIDS running rampant all over the place. Lurid and terrible things happening. Nobody has any morals or nothing anymore. Now this 60 generation who has gray hair and are in political offices are trying to turn this thing around. You see what free love will do you? Because they didn't know what love was. To them, love was physical. And the church let it happen because the church, their Jesus was dead. They told people, you come to God, well, you got saved this morning. Now listen here, Jack, this thing gonna get tough, but hang on till the end. If you get sick, well, just will your money to the church. If you don't... <laughs> If you go to hell, we'll pray you out for $95. <laughs> we got a sale on two of you for $37.50. <laughs> Notice that. That's true. And we produce this do your own things junk. Flower children that are killing. Now we can't hardly revert the thing. Think about it for a minute. See what happens when the spirit of Eros takes over? It produces killing, immorality, divorce over 50%. Notice that. That's what it produced. Free love. Yeah, it's free. It'll kill you today. Now they don't know how to handle it. They don't know what to do with it. The president, even the Congress are saying, men don't want to even serve our nation anymore. It's caused disloyalty and unity in everything this country stood for. Do your own thing. It's caused the illiteracy, illiterates to come up 
people can't, are not even educated. Graduating from high school can't read. Discipline was pulled out and thrown away. Churches compromised God's word. They produced a dead Jesus with lethal inc inconsistency. We had the era of the counselor. We forgot the comforter. I'm preaching to you like a pastor this morning. I'm going to get evangelistic tonight. Why don't you listen to what I'm saying? saying. Pilate said, I will not release that body unless I know he's dead. A dead Jesus can't, help, can't hurt me. Satan sat back and laughed at us for 20 years. We talked about how bad Vietnam was. And how bad. I've been in that era. I lived that. I know what I'm talking about. I was there. I've been, I, I've been in that area. I was born in 1949. So I, was, I got one of them letters. Gentlemen. I got one of those letters from the government. Sir, come to Vietnam where the rice is growing. <laughs> Nothing wrong with fighting for your country. You're supposed to. How do you know that? I can prove it scripturally. Because Jesus, the nation of Israel, fought for their country. That's so what God told him, go over and possess my land. And all this free thing started a snowball effect. And they began to kill people. Now we've got kids telling their parents, go to your room. <laughs> Don't want to hurt his feelings. You don't need to hurt his feelings. Just bust his rear end. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. That's not popular today, but it's the truth. If I don't want to mess up his mind. He's going to mess up your life. Because the spirit of Eros is controlling him. You hear what I'm saying? My mother told me, don't you ever sass me, boy, even when I'm dead. Because the rapture will come and I'll come out of that grave and beat your brains out as I go. <laughs> See what it's produced? How many of y'all had mamas like that? Hold your hand up. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this powerful message by Jesse Duplantis. Remember to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell in order to be up to date with all things Jesse Duplantis Ministries. For more information, visit our website at jdm.org. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.